All right, we're going to continue on our series of We Believe. Uh, we're going to go through 10 Essential Doctrines. And uh, last week, as a nice introduction, we decided to talk about, hey, what what is doctrine? If we're going to talk about main doctrines, what, what is that even? What are we even talking about? And so we talked about how it's a collection of beliefs and then kind of the purpose of doctrine, um, why, why it's important, because Jesus told us that we need to go and teach everything that he gave us to do. That is really the core of discipleship, is to go and baptize and, and then teach them everything that Jesus taught us to do. And also the, the, the early church, they practiced it. They gathered together in prayer and fellowship and breaking of bread and the apostles' doctrine. So we see uh, time and time again throughout Scripture that they were dedicated to um, not having their slides advanced. There we go. Okay. Um, they were dedicated to, to doctrine and to teaching. And we want to be we want to be a house that knows what we believe and a house that effectively teaches what we believe through through stuff like this where we teach doctrine in kind of the classroom type didactic teaching environment, but probably more so through the individual relationships that we have as we have a cup of coffee with someone, as we invite someone over for lunch or for dinner, and we're sharing our lives, we're teaching doctrine by explaining how that doctrine is alive and well in our lives. So today we're going to talk about the doctrine of Scripture and we're starting with the doctrine of Scripture because really it's out of Scripture that all of the other doctrines kind of flow out of. So I figure it's a good place to start if we're going to constantly be referring to Scripture for all of our doctrines that we're going to talk about. We best do a little looking at this book and what we believe about it so that we can all be unified, maybe even begin to dispel some rumors or some false information that might uh, be spread about here and there. And uh, kind of one of the core verses, when you talk about the doctrine of Scripture, would be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And in verse uh, 16, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. How many people here would like to be, and another word for that complete is mature. How many in the room, you, you would like it to be said of you that you are mature and complete and equipped for every good work? Okay, like half of us, that's awesome. I will take half. God, <laughs> God can do a lot with half of us, you know what I'm saying? And so, so that is the purpose of Scripture. Now, a lot of people that would be kind of uh, maybe uh, skeptical or analytical about this verse, uh, well, they could say, hey, well, bro, that's circular reasoning. You know, to, to say that Scripture is inspired from a verse that comes from inside of that Scripture um, is circular reasoning and is therefore nonsense. Okay, that is true when you are talking about uh, just truth of any kind. If you're talking about, uh, like, the, the age-old debate right now is uh, in gender, gender studies, right? So a big question they like to ask is, what is a woman? But you can't define woman with the word woman in the, dis in, in the definition, right? Because then that is therefore a circle, right? You can't define it, say, a woman is somebody that identifies as a woman. Okay, well, you still haven't told me, you still haven't told me what a woman is. So what does it mean to identify as that, right? So, so you could try to apply the same thing here. The main difference is that we are talking about an ultimate authority. When you're talking about an ultimate authority, anybody ever 
that is trying to say that something is the ultimate authority has to circle. Because if it's the ultimate authority, it's the only authority that's going to actually answer the question. We believe that scripture is the ultimate authority. Therefore, yes, we, we have to look to scripture to address the issue. Because so if somebody comes and says, well, I don't believe that this is true. Okay, well, then you have now set yourself as the ultimate authority. And it's a free world. You can do that. But I would want to. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. This, this is real people in a real church, you know? So sometimes we just got to say something, you know? And so, so, like, you can do that. You can establish yourself as the ultimate authority. Um, I'm not going to do that for myself because I'm not trustworthy enough, okay? I, I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough, like not, none of the enoughs that you need to be an ultimate authority do I qualify for. And so it's important to recognize if, if you're saying that it's not, then what is? And it's okay for people to disagree with us because, hey, the message of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. Come on. So we, we need to expect that people will have some challenge believing it unless the Spirit of God is breathing on it in that moment. And you never know when the Spirit of God is going to breathe on it. So preach the Word. And preach it well. And preach it often. And preach it through your actions as well. Like, live that. So we're going to talk about a couple of concepts. One, that Scripture is trustworthy. Two, that it is inspired. And three, that it is authoritative. Those are going to be the three main concepts. And I will say, as a matter of introduction, that there are books and books and books and books written on this topic. So am I going to give you an exhaustive answer every question type of covering of this doctrine? No. <laughs> uh, let the cat out of the bag. Everybody's leaving. Oh, shoot. You know, so, but, so I'm not going to answer all your questions. I'm not going to cover every single thing. But we're going we're gonna to just give a little foundation. And I encourage you, just like I said last week, if you have questions that you would like covered in any of our future uh, sermons, as we go through this doctrine series, text me, email me. Smoke, smoke signals work really well. Uh, as long as there's not a burn ban on, just you got to watch that. But um, I would love to hear your questions so that we can address those specifically, because I would like it to be as applicable to our house as possible. So we're going to we're going to cover some stuff, but it will inevitably maybe spark more questions or leave some questions that you already have unanswered. Don't be rattled by that. Just hey, like send me some questions or you know, do some research. I just I don't really recommend TikTok as your primary resource of doctrine uh, research. So maybe check that off your list. Um, even Google, you have to be real careful because if you ask Google uh, what the purpose of life is, they'll say, look inside yourself and keep looking inside yourself and pretty soon you'll find it. And I just don't think that that's probably the best place to look for your purpose in life. So Google does not have all the answers. It is not the ultimate authority, okay? So even if Google tells you it is, it's not true, okay? So um, what, is, what is scriptures? Uh, the Bible is a collection of 66 books. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, written primarily in three different languages, Hebrew and Greek being the two primaries, with a sprinkling of Aramaic in there just for fun, just to make it more fun and confusing. No. Um, so uh, the, first, the first kind of evidence of its trustworthiness is its manuscript evidence. I was uh, doing research and stuff for this, and I liked what one guy said. He said, you don't, you don't really want to measure um, manuscripts in quantity, but in weight, because not every piece of manuscript evidence is worth the same as another piece. Because literally, if you get a little tiny piece of the parchment that it was written on, and it, you know, maybe one verse, or maybe a half a verse of the Bible, uh, obviously it wouldn't have actually been a verse yet, because that didn't happen until much, much later. 
around 1500s. And so, <laughs> um, but that would, be a, that would be considered a piece of manuscript evidence. But how, like, how weighty is it? Well, it's nice to have, and it's supporting the fact that what we have today is accurate. But where you really start to see the weight of it happen when you get larger pieces of manuscript evidence, and obviously the older the manuscript, the better, okay? And so they have, uh, it's really crazy actually how reliably the biblical manuscripts have been transferred over the years to where when you take this book in your hands today, and yes, even translations like the NIV that a lot of people like to criticize, the CSB, the ESV, the NASB, the NKJV, the KJV, like, they're, they're all good. You can use all of them. And actually, I recommend using multiples because it's kind of like doing Greek and Hebrew word studies without having to know how to use all the tools. And that's pretty cool. So, um, and when you have like the version Bible app, you can just click, 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 flip them through. You don't even have to go buy a bunch of them, you know? It's amazing. <laughs> and um, uh, side note, did you know that the guy that created that, he works for a, he works for a church. I mean, well, he works for version, which is a ministry of a church. And he actually was offered millions of dollars to sell version. I believe Zondervan actually was the company that was trying to purchase it. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And uh, he flatly uh, rejected the offer because he was like, no, version is going to stay free. It's going to be free. It's never going to be... It's never going to be a product to be sold uh, on the market. And uh, they're, now they're, they're translating the Bible into massive amounts of languages, That's making right. things. It's, it's unbelievable. And the reason is because they have a high view of Scripture. They believe that Scripture is the Word of God. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it, yeah. it cuts between the motives and intentions and thoughts of the heart. Yeah. It, it does stuff to people that we can't do with witty sayings and clever conversations. You know, it's like the word of God. And that's where our, our doctrine of scripture is so critical because I actually believe that the primary tool of discipleship is the word of God. Yes. You can do a book club and you can, you know, you can watch a cool DVD. Do they even do that anymore? Do they make DVD players anymore? You can stream. <laughs> You can stream a cool, you know, uh, video series about a study on the book of Ruth or whatever, and that's cool. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, and I, I fully support that. But to just get around a, a coffee table or a, a lunch table and to teach someone how to read the Word of God and how to gain insight from the Holy Spirit from the Word of God is teaching someone to fish rather than serving them some catfish. Though, it's nice to serve someone some catfish every once in a while. That's what LT said, anyway. So, all, right. <laughs> all right, so, um, there, are so uh, there are so many uh, manuscript pieces of the Bible. Uh, to give you an example uh, of ancient literature, one of, the, one of the pieces of literature that has the most Manuscript evidence is uh, the Iliad by uh, by Homer. And they have 643 uh, pieces of manuscript evidence for this book that that they teach to people as you know reliable. It's actually what he said. It's actually the story that he wanted you to read. That I mean, they grade people on it. You know what I'm saying? Like they make people write essays about it and and. Uh, and it has 643 uh, different pieces of manuscript evidence with an accuracy of 95%. So it's actually like pretty solid, you know, like all of the manuscripts that they have agree 95% of the time. And that's the best you're going to get. Okay, that, that is the best. And um, by quite a few, by quite a few, because the next one, is uh, some work by Sophocles, and that is 193 pieces of manuscript evidence, and they don't even rate the accuracy because it's kind of all over the place. 
Uh, the next one down from that is 49 pieces. And again, they don't even rate. Um, and that would be Aristotle. Again, somebody that we would look to uh, for philosophy and wisdom. And so, and then 20 pieces, and then 10 pieces. And, and these are all names, you know, Plato. <laughs> Plato is down to seven. And the earliest manuscript is a good, like, 1,200 years from when he actually lived. So imagine, imagine what could have happened in the 1,200 years that we don't know where the manuscripts were at and what was going on. The Bible um, was recorded less than 100 years after Jesus lived. The, the New Testament, I should say. Uh, the New Testament was less than 100 years. So it was written, the content of the New Testament, because when you, when you talk about the inspiration of Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16 is definitely referring to the Old Testament for sure, because it was the established body of Scripture at the time. Far, like, for hundreds of years, it was the accepted body of of Hebrew scripture without any objection. Nobody, nobody had any uh, erring opinions on that. Everybody accepted essentially the 39 books that we have as the, their Bible, so to speak. But also, at the time of the writing of 2 Timothy, many of the letters that we currently have in the New Testament were already in circulation. And there's a, a fella by the name of F.F. F. Bruce. And I just have to find the quote here. I highlighted it in red, so it would be easy to find. So when you talk about the canonization, the putting together of the scriptures, um, and the word canon literally means like a measurement. So it's like uh, the measurement process that the books went through to become a part of what we now refer to as the canon of scripture, the Bible as we know it today. Because a lot of people on TikTok <laughs> um, and all sorts of other places, they will they'll get on there and they'll say, the Bible is so ridiculous because uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus lived, these people got together and they decided what books should go into the New Testament because they had Plans. It was a, like it's full on conspiracy theory about who they were trying to control. And believe me, it, have there been crazy stories in church history where people have done atrocious, diabolical, tragic things in the name of God? Yes. Yeah. And I will not try to say that didn't happen. I, I don't feel like I have to defend those actions in order for God to be true and for the Bible to be true. Amen. Uh, what that proves to me is that we are born in sin and we're a big mess. And we better, we better be careful. And we better treat the word with honor and respect. And we better come, like I said last week, we better come humbly. And we better check our motives. And we better, we better process scripture prayerfully because the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us in all truth. F.F. Bruce says, one thing must be emphatically stated. The New Testament books did not become authoritative for the church because they were formally included in a canonical list. On the contrary, the church included them in her canon because she already regarded them as divinely inspired. They looked and they were like, bro, everybody agrees these are the books. Well, what about Thomas? I mean, Thomas wrote a good gospel. And they're like, no, dude, have you read that? Actually, it doesn't even exist yet because it was written hundreds of years later. But like, like Thomas's book is jacked, and that's why it's not included in the canon. Like, it's messed up. It's total Gnosticism. <laughs> so there are clear reasons why they did not include books, uh, books that were out there into the canon of Scripture. And uh, it's kind of funny because... Uh, when they initially had like the collection that is the Old Testament, uh, it was 22 books. And so you're like, ha, I gotcha. 
You know, it's not the 39 books, but they actually counted all of the minor prophets as one book. And uh, Ezra and Nehemiah were considered one book. And so uh, there were, there were, and then First and Second Kings was just the kings. And First and Second Samuel was just Samuel. And we like to have more books so that your reading plan is easier and more manageable. So it's all very good. So, um, all right. Um, as far as the trustworthiness of the Bible goes, when you think about people that wrote the Bible, well, um, did they make stuff up? You know, specifically in regards again, to the New Testament and specifically in regards to the Gospels, because really the Gospels are pretty critical. Am I right? Like um, the story, the account of Jesus' life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection kind of critical, right? Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we are to be pitied above all men, right? Like, those poor, poor saps, you know? Like, I feel so bad for them because Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. And that would be true if Jesus did not indeed rise from the dead. But if he did rise from the dead, we got some explaining to do, you know, about how we're living our lives and what we're doing with ourselves. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, that changes everything. So the reliability of what Matthew and Mark and Luke and John had to say is pretty important. So one thing that you want to consider, uh, a gentleman by the name of Jim Warner Wallace, he wrote a book called Cold Case Christianity, and he's like an evidence kind of guy, and he's, he's really knowledgeable about uh, eyewitness uh, testimony and things that you want to consider when somebody's giving testimony about the veracity of a situation. And one of the things that he talks about is the person giving the testimony, do they have a motive? Do they have a reason to lie about whatever the situation is? Okay, so um, Paul, and or not Paul, because he came just a little bit later, Peter and James and John in their sailboat, okay, like they, they could have just gone back to fishing and lived the rest of their lives telling good stories about those three years they spent with that guy. And nobody would have ever cared about anything. Like, it would have been fine. Their lives would have been totally normal and good. I mean, they might have had that small collection of people that make fun of them every once in a while because like, Oh, yeah, you guys were part of that Jesus guy, and then whoops, he ended up on a cross, and oh, I'm sorry for that, guys, you know, like, you must feel real bad about those three years you spent. That would have been, like, the worst of it. Instead, if it's not true, they lied and created a story that they all died for. Okay, that is a terrible plan, guys, like, if I was one of them, I would have been like, guys, you can do whatever you want to do. I'm out. Like, I hear Sicily is nice this time of year, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go there in my sailboat. It's going to kind of ruin the song, you know? Like, if Peter, James, and John aren't together, what, what's that all about? So, so they didn't have any motive, because typical motives would be lust and power and greed. They weren't getting any of that stuff as a result of their amazing lies about Jesus, okay? So there's no evidence that they had any of these reasons. Also, to the positive, to support their tr the truth of their story, is the transformed lives of the disciples. What were they doing the night that Jesus was uh, betrayed and arrested and put on trial? Were they there, you know, like having a, a riot, you know, to like protest? Let Jesus go, you know, like, let, no, they were gone. They, they were hiding, shaking in their boots, if they had boots, sandals perhaps, I don't know. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, former White House Special Counsel Chuck Colson, uh, they, they call him uh, Nixon's hatchet man in the Watergate scandal. He says that Watergate, Watergate, Watergate helped prove to him Watergate helped prove to him that the Bible is true. Okay, tell me about this, Chuck. You know, I'm, I'm glad you asked. He watched, he watched as 10 of the most powerful men in the United States rapidly broke down their conspiracy under the pressure from authorities within weeks 
of the investigation being launched. Like they all fell apart. And yet you take this ragtag crazy group of disciples that Jesus brought together. And I don't care how good of an influencer Jesus was on the 12. When people are threatening your life, I mean, the disciples endured terrible stuff. I mean, Paul, are you telling me that Jesus did not rise from the dead and Paul did what he did? Got beat to death, you know, like this close to death a couple of times, stuck out in the middle of the sea for a night and a day and was stoned to death and then got up and went and kept being a missionary because he had stuff to do. Never mind that gash in my head. I got to preach the gospel, you know, like. That is the impact that Jesus was having on people after he was supposedly still dead. So there's a lot more to explain. If if Jesus did not rise from the dead, we have got way bigger problems to try to figure out, like, what kind of disease was going on. 500 people saw Jesus alive after he was in the tomb. And you, you, can't get, you can't get psychologists to give you a theory about how 500 people at the same time could all see the same thing without some really crazy voodoo action going on. So, and I don't think that Satan would be all like, yeah, I'm going to like get a whole like demonic thing going on so everybody will see Jesus alive because that would really work out well for me. You know, like I can't see that happening. So the books of the Bible are the ones that the early followers of Jesus considered authoritative. What F.F. Bruce was saying, he's like, they were all good. They were all agreed on these things. And so that is why they got put into the canon. Because a lot of people will say, man, they didn't even put the Bible together till almost 400 A.D. Because they had uh, councils at Hippo and, and Carthage. But they weren't trying to impose something new or create something, they were trying to preserve what had already been established so that it didn't get messed up. So they're like, whoa, whoa, hold on. Like, we all know, you know, metaphorically speaking, like, we all know that this is what we need. Like, this is, these are the books we need to be studying and we need to be passing around. And so, man, there's some crazy people out there writing some new stuff and we don't want to get in there and mess it all up because we want the message to be preserved. So that's what they were doing at these councils to canonize scripture. Again, was not to drive forward some crazy, awesome conspiracy theory to control people's lives, but so that the purity of the message of a risen Christ could be sent across the world, even to us today. All right. So the gospel, the, the Bible is inspired. What does inspiration mean? The word inspiration, you know, if you inspire, you're breathing in. If you expire, you're dead. No, you're, you're breathing out, expiring. Funny. English is funny like that. So, um, so uh, we're glad that the word is inspired, not expired. Can I get any men? All right, so I'm just trying to get really tweetable tweets in my sermon, you know, so uh, I right know. <laughs> but uh, you're like, yeah, it's inspired. Uh, so we believe uh, in the plenary verbal inspiration of Scripture. And that means we believe that the Bible is inspired to the very words that are on the page. And this, of course, would be in the original language that it was reported, okay? So... So Greek and Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic, uh, that would be the inspired text. We don't believe that, uh, we believe that God wrote the Bible and that man wrote the Bible together at the same time. We don't believe that God put them into a trance or the Holy Spirit took over their bodies and like uh, what, what people would recall, uh, would refer to as automatic writing. We don't believe in automatic writing as our Doctrine of scriptural, you know, how we got scripture. We believe that God actually used the shepherd and used the scribe 
and used crazy Matthew the tax collector and his opinions and his personality and Peter. You know, like the, the gospel of Mark is the story of Peter, right? Because Mark, who is Mark? Like, and why, why did he write a gospel? You know, like, but, you know, a lot of people say Peter was like, so he did not want his name on a gospel. And so he was like, yeah, Mark, you write it. <laughs> I'll tell you all the stories and you write it all down and we'll put your name on it because I don't want my name on that because you know my story. Like I denied the guy a few times. Like, you know, I think, I think Peter was, well, that's another sermon. We'll, we'll, we'll do that one another time. God wrote the Bible, man wrote the Bible. Supernatural, not just natural, divine, not just human, living, not mechanical, conscious, not trance-like, plenary, complete, not partial. So we believe in the whole Bible, not in the parts that we like. We're not going to be all Thomas Jefferson and cut out all the miracles in the Bible. Like, you know, we believe in miracles. God created the heavens and the earth. Miracle! And so if more miracles happen after that, that seems normal. Like, that's okay. My, my theology allows for miracles. So that's fine. And verbal, not merely conceptual. So the that God is sovereign enough to work through a human being, exercising what he what has lived his life, and now he's putting pen to parchment or whatever, <laughs> you know, however they did that, in a, it's a pen to paper, and he's writing a story. And the very word selection is even God-inspired. That's how powerful God is. Like, if you believe in Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth, then believing that God inspired the writing of Scripture through normal human beings is not that big of a stretch. It's authoritative. Have you ever heard the statement from C.S. Lewis that says, Jesus did not allow the option for him to be considered a good teacher? Because Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. If you've seen God the Father, if you've seen me, you have seen God the Father. So he's not a good teacher. He's either God, he's a horrible, lying psychopath, or he's a complete lunatic. So, Lord, liar, lunatic. It's three L's. It's very nice. Good job, C.S. Lewis. Very sharp man. Um, but it's like, wow, that actually makes a lot of sense. It's not actually logical for someone to say, oh, you know, I like Jesus. He had some good teachings. No, dude. Millions of people have died because of the words that he said. So if his words are not true, he's the worst ever. Like, the worst. You think Hitler's bad? Like, if Jesus is a liar, if it's not true, he's the worst. Yeah. The Bible is the same. Because the Bible, countless times, I mean, we read one, 2 Corinthians 3, 16. Hey, all this scripture is inspired. It's God-breathed, and it's useful for instruction. And, and then how many times throughout the Bible? It's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times that the authors of scripture said, and the word of the Lord came to me. And God said, and the word of the Lord came, and God said, so if it's not true, then there's nothing really redeemable about this book. Amen. It's either God's word, or let's get rid of it. Yeah. Let's not waste our time. But when you look at the external evidence of what scripture has accomplished, and the fact that we even have the Bible today, is really testimony to its inspiration. The preservation of scripture is, is something that is really unexplainable. Because no book has been more hated, more aggressively pursued to be burned and completely eliminated, and yet we have more manuscript evidence for the Bible, for really the New Testament alone, than we do about stuff that other people really actually care about. Like we care about Homer, 
and we can only put together 500 pieces? Like, that, that was the best we could do? And yet we've got almost 6,000 pieces of manuscript evidence for the Bible. When people have been actively trying to destroy it for years and years and discredit it. And what do you get, actually? You look at a, a manuscript of the book of Isaiah and you translate it to today's English. And guess what you get? You get basically what you get when you open your Bible that you're holding in your hands right now. You get the bestseller. That's insanity. The bestseller ever. That's right. I mean, it's kind of an unfair advantage when you've been selling the book for thousands and thousands of years. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <laughs> no, but it's true. It is the bestseller. So um, that was going to be my fourth point after authoritative, really good seller. It was going to be the fourth point there. Okay. So it's kind of like the what, right? Did I actually cover the last one? Authoritative, yes, because it's the word of God. So that's our what. What is it? It's authoritative. It's inspired. It's the other word. <laughs> Man, I don't know. Trustworthy. Yeah, that's right. Good. It's good. Trustworthy. So what? So why? So why does it matter? Well, I think it's a little bit like, well, you know, Jesus is the word made flesh. So it's okay that I'm seeing all of these parallels, right? Between what we believe about the Bible and what we believe about Jesus and how we respond to Jesus and how we respond to the Bible should be pretty similar, right? Because if Jesus is true, if Jesus rose from the dead, if Jesus actually died for your sins, it should show. Like, it matters. It's kind of earth shattering. Like, it's kind of paradigm shifting. Like, so it matters because. If the Bible is true, then God is God, and Jesus is our Savior, and heaven is real, and hell is real, and the Holy Spirit is here to help us, and salvation is through Christ alone. It changes everything. So the Word of God is profitable for teaching and rebuking and correcting and to make us Mature and complete, equipped to do the good work that God has called us to do. Well, I want to be, if I'm called to do something, I certainly want to be equipped. Amen. So the way that people are equipped to do the work of God, and I love small groups, but it's not being in a small group. It's not even being a part of a church on Sundays, though I'm very that like it's the word of God Amen. the word of God is what's going to equip people so we need to stop distracting people we need to stop distracting people with all kinds of accoutrements right that they can get distracted with and we need to point people to scripture yes. time and time and time again because it's what changes people it's what makes them mature have you ever known that person that said a prayer and gave their life to Christ when they were 12? And spiritually, it's like they haven't moved the needle at all. Like, like you're still a baby when it comes to Christianity. Like, what, what is going on? Hey, tell me about your spiritual diet. What's that look like? Oh, you know, catch the verse of the day on... Uh, my favorite TikTok influencer. I'm <laughs> being up, beat up on TikTok today. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I just get all my theology from TikTok, and I'm pretty sure that Jesus is uh, not really the Savior of the universe. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Jesus didn't actually exist. I literally watched this video by this guy that was like, God is so dumb that he would tie his entire thing to a guy that you can't even prove existed. <laughs> I was like, this is like the dumbest video I've ever seen in my whole life. Because normal, I, you know, not even the Christian ones, but just normal scholars would say that if you try to say that Jesus of Nazareth did not exist, you're just really dumb. Like, you really don't know what you're talking about. And yet, 
You can look in the guy's comment section. He's got all kinds of people following him that are like, wow, thank you. That was so awesome that you freed me by telling me the truth. No, it's a horrible, horrible lie. Jesus did exist. He's the most provable, like, really, the fact that we know that Jesus existed. Um, some nobody from some nobody town in some nobody part of the world. Like, if he didn't actually die for the sins of the world and rise from the dead, there's no reason why anybody should know that he ever existed. He was born to a nobody. He was a nobody. He basically lived a nobody life. And yet here we are, 2,000 plus years later, and we're all dedicating our lives to him. That doesn't happen by accident. No. So, it's, uh, one guy out there, uh, Frank Turk, he's like a, an apologist, and he, uh, he does talks all the time. I think, he's, I think he also wrote a book by the same title. Um, he's just like, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Um, because, because the leaps that you have to make to get to the idea that there isn't a God. So I told you we would say, what? So what? And then the third question is, now what? Okay, so we believe that the Bible is trustworthy. We believe that it's authoritative. We believe that it's inspired. Okay, now we, we've decided that, okay, if that's all true that that's kind of earth shattering and that's going to change some things. So what? So what do we do now what? Like, what do we do now? Like, okay, so it's true. I believe it. I agree. Well, I think that... Sorry, I had other slides. So, first and foremost, read the Bible. <laughs> Uh, it's a good place to start. Give God opportunity to breathe on the words as they're coming into your eyeballs and your earballs. Uh, so this lady that, uh, one of the most incredible encouragers on the planet, her name is Marsha, Marsha Duffel. And uh, she's just the most incredible, she's the kind of person that, uh, like, the way, if, the way she lives her life would be considered like a nobody kind of life. Like, no, nothing notable. You would never pull her up on the stage and be like, Marsha, share the word of the Lord today. But what she does behind the scenes is she prays for people and she watches their life. And one day, when you don't even know you need it, this package will show up in this letter. And she would say, I've been praying for you. And here's the word of the Lord for you today. And here's some nice little gifts things that I thought about when I was praying for you, things that I thought would be really beneficial. She, she'll send you a book and she'll send you a, a gift card to your favorite coffee place and a cool coffee mug, you know, with a favorite scripture. Like, it's incredible, the, the ministry of encouragement and exhortation that yeah. she carried, like the anointing on her life. I told a lot of like the big preacher guys in our big giant church, I was like, you know, she's gonna be in front of you in line. Uh, in heaven for all the honor because, whoa. <laughs> like, I just want to be more like Marsha. <laughs> like, I want to live a life where behind the scenes, no honor, no glory about it, but blessing people like crazy. I mean, and the generosity, who man. So read the word of God. And uh, anyway, the whole Marsha thing, she always referred to her ears as her earballs, you know, her eyeballs and her earballs. That's why I was talking about Marsha. <laughs> um, I almost made me cry. I really love Marsha. She's awesome. But um, So get the word of God into your eyeballs and your earballs. You know? Get the word of God into your heart so that the Holy Spirit has more content to breathe on. Yeah. Holy Spirit is just waiting to speak to you. And he's like, well, I've prepared a lot of notes for you. If you'd come to the meetings with me, I would love to share them with you. I would love to breathe on it and turn it to life, so it's not just the logos on the page, but it's the rhema alive in your spirit that stirs you to action, because that's what we need. We need, we need the word of God, not simply sitting in the book, but alive in our hearts, 
Because we believe that it is the inspired word of God. So we're going to read it and we're going to study it. And we're going to memorize it and watch out. We're going to surrender to it. Which means when you're trying to prepare a devotional video and it says not to put your trust in the horses for your safety and your security. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, Rick, what about your horses? Then I can't just move on. I can't just act as if I've never seen that before. I've never heard that. I have to get down on my knees and say, okay, Holy Spirit, you're right. Yeah, you're right. I, I do, like, I put money, you know, like my budget as my security. Do I have enough money in the bank? Do I? All that stuff could be different tomorrow. There's plenty of people in the United States history. You don't even have to go to world history, but it had moments where today everything was great, financially speaking. And tomorrow, whoops-a-daisy, I don't have any bread. <laughs> you know, like, I'm waiting in line, hoping I can get a piece of bread. So I better not put my hope and my security there. So we need to surrender to it. We need to share and teach it. We need to engage with it on an individual level, and we need to engage with it in a community level. This is where I do believe in small groups. It's why my small group on Friday mornings, we read the Bible together. Because, you know, the early church, I, I'm a believer in, you know, spending time alone with God. I, I'm a big fan of devotions in the morning. You know, like, go and do your devotions. And and, and let the Holy Spirit speak to you and dig into the Word of God. Like, do all that. But also understand that our American individualistic me, me, me world is not the world that the Bible was written in. That actually the early church folks that we want to emulate so badly, we want to be like Peter, we want to be like uh, Mark, and we want to be like John, and, and we want to be like Paul, well, they didn't have personal copies of scripture to study at home at their coffee table. <laughs> they went to the temple or they memorized it so that they could talk about it as they're breaking bread and house to house. So, hey, we don't have to memorize it all because we can carry it with us. Praise the Lord for that. But maybe we'd be better off if we were memorizing it. So don't just interact with the Word of God by yourself with TikTok. <laughs> uh, find a small group of people to regularly open Scripture together and read together and talk about it together. Because sometimes you get crazy ideas in your head about what that verse means. I've had it happen tons of times where I had somebody in my in my group when I was leading this group back in Portland, and they'd, they'd be like, oh, well, what that verse means to me is blah, blah, blah. And it's like the opposite of what the verse actually means. And, you know, they mean well. It's not like they were setting out to have a poor understanding of what that scripture means. They just didn't know. It's like, oh, well, hey, um, do, you mind if I, do you mind if I share something with you? Oh, yeah, please. Well, you know, actually, if you, in their culture, this is what that would have meant, and so it's actually flip flop. Like uh, in Proverbs, it says that you know you want to heap burning coals of fire on your enemy's head. That sounds awesome. That's exactly what I want to do. You cross me, I'll heap burning coals of fire on your head. I'll be like, hell come early, you know what I mean? Is that God? Is that what God's trying to say? No. Burning coals that you would use for fire were a blessing. Because it was a way to heat your home. Potentially even prepare food over. <laughs> so to heap burning coals of fire on someone's head was to gift them something of great value. And bless their life. Well, shoot. That's not what I want to do at all. <laughs> so that's where we have to repent. You know, that's literally what the word repent means. Is to change your way of thinking which then changed your way of behaving. So I'm supposed to bless them that curse me and pray for them? Come on, Jesus. Ah. 
But if I am his enemy, do I want him to burn me or do I want him to make a way for me? Well, when you turn the tables like that, obviously. Okay. So, individual community, stand firm and defend it when necessary. If you had, and I'll wrap it up on this point, I promise. If you had your favorite taco shop, anybody eat tacos here? Okay, well, I know you're not from Portland, but there's a couple of taco shops in Portland that are like, whoa. I mean, there's Jesus, and then there's these tacos. Okay, that's not really true, but just to give you a picture of how divine, okay? Now, so there's this one, if, uh, you know, like, like, I feel like Fuzzy's Tacos is like the big famous one around here. So let's pretend that the taco shop in question is called Fuzzy's Tacos. And because um, in Portland, there's literally this one, the name of it is escaping me right now, which is really annoying. But they have super long lines all the time, right? Because it's so popular. And so, but they kind of like create it to be part of the experience. When you're going to get these tacos, you're going to wait in this line, you're going to meet interesting people while you're in line for these life-changing tacos. And so if, like, if you're like the biggest fan of these tacos, and, and somebody pipes up online, and they, they put a nasty review in there, and they're like, these tacos, Matt, and wait so long, and blah, whatever, they like just unload, you know, like one of those, one of those people that do those kinds of things. Um, <laughs> They, uh, one of our friends says they're going to yelp their butts. So they're going to they're gonna yelp their butts. And so, so somebody's yelping their butts, right, for these tacos. Well, because you are a disciple of the taco shop, you're going to actually try to put right the misconceptions. Like, no, you don't understand. That's not actually true. That's not actually what goes on at that taco shop. And the same should be true about our relationship with Jesus. When somebody's spouting up all kinds of crazy lies about who Jesus is and what he stands for, we should defend it. Not because God needs a defender. He doesn't. But because there are people that believe lies, and those lies keep them locked up in chains. Yes. And we are the people, we, we have the truth. It doesn't mean we have all truth and we know everything, but, so we need to be humble but we need to buck up against those misconceptions and misperceptions of who Jesus is That's right. or who the church is. Can I get an amen? amen? There are a lot of people that are walking around with deep wounds from the church. And I'm not here to say, like I said, yeah, the church does terrible things to people sometimes. But God is not the one that hurts you. And God's still working on the church. Who's been hurt the most by the church? God. <laughs> God's been hurt time and time again. Who hasn't given up on the church? God, thank God. You know, thank God that he has not given up on the church. So we shouldn't give up on the church either. We need to be a part of the church. We need to be engaged in the church. We need to be invested. So that was like 27 sermons in one. I appreciate your patience today. So next, the next three weeks, uh, doctrine of God, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, doctrine of Jesus Christ. It's going to be good. If you have questions, comments, concerns that you want addressed, talked about, thought about, whatever. Like I said, text me, email me, rick at the lumbertonchurch.com. Really, should be easy to remember. Um, and then, like I said, smoke signals also. My wife's really good at interpreting them, so I'll get her out there and she'll, she'll write it down. She took a class in it. It was cool. So, um, some of that last part might not be true. So, um, <laughs> But, uh, all right, how many feel encouraged to read your Bible, memorize, share, process it, surrender to it? Uh, I wish you hadn't brought that one up again, Rick. I know. All right, Father God, Lord, thank you so much today for your word. Thank you, God, for the fact that you've made it clear and understandable. Lord, it takes some work, but Lord, you've made it so we can know you through scripture. I pray, God, that you would make us a body that is so dedicated, God, to your word, to knowing you, and to walking that truth out. Lord, we want to be life everywhere we go. We want to bring life to this community. Yeah. And so we just pray that you would work your word deep in our hearts. Transform us, God. Mold us, shape us. Make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen.